Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, Spirited Conversations with Interesting People. I am your host, Christopher Hart. So, uh, we've got lots happening in the next month. Uh, specifically, next week, the Executive Director of the TABC, the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission. Not a rep, not their marketing guy, not their PR guy. The Executive Director, the top dog at the most hated <laughs> Uh, police organization here in the in the state of Texas uh, in regards to alcohol will be here in studio to discuss the big bad wolf. Now, before we go too down too far down the rabbit hole, let me set some expectations. The TBC is not responsible for regulations, not responsible for laws. They're only responsible for enforcing it. So I may ask him, and I plan to ask him about some of the bull crap. Uh, blue laws that we deal with here in Texas, like not being able to buy liquor on Sunday or just some of the the nonsense we deal with. But I have a feeling like he may not um, comment on that. Now, that being said, I do have a way to kind of, I'm going to bait him a little bit. I want to ask him, you know, do you have any input? Do they ask you for your input? Do they provide any input? That answer may simply be no, but if the answer is yes, sometimes he provides input, then I'd like to hear what he has to say. I'm I'm giving away my complete strategy. I'm going to talk to him next week, so it's going to be great. We have a lot happening this week uh, or this month. Um, this week, as always, is sponsored by Trilado Distill Artisan Spirits, leader in premium artisan products like Bunahaben, Deanston, Lechegg, Tobermory, Baines, Black Bottle, and Scottish Leader. You can pick up the entire line at your local liquor store, or if you are a retailer, you can reach out to your local United Wine and Spirits rep here in Texas and get those bottles into your store. Uh, they are big sponsors of us, and I will tell you, in all legitimacy, I bought this bottle yesterday. Um, to bring to a viewing party for something I'm working on, and it, uh, I'm I'm very happy. Dean Stin makes a phenomenal single malt, uh, and I just picked this up yesterday as well. The Bordeaux red wine finished. We didn't get to it today, but we'll get to it next week. I'm very happy with with the whole line, and I'm very thankful for their sponsorship. So, uh, this week we sit down with Rasul Zarnfar and Taylor with Buffalo by Brewing. These guys. Um, obviously there's been a lot happening. Why are you having the back on Chris? There's been a lot happening in the state of Texas in regards to beer the last couple of weeks. In particular, a uh, provision was added on, tacked on to a bill in which you can now buy beer on Sunday, a couple hours earlier than usual. For those of you who are out of state or trying to figure out why does that, why, why couldn't you buy beer at a certain time anyways? Well, Texas is very archaic. So, uh, it made it through the the rep the House of Representatives, and now it's moving on to the Senate. We'll see where it goes. But we also tacked on beer to go in 49 states in the U.S. And I don't know if you know this for our foreign listeners, but there are a total of 50 states in the U.S. And 49 of them are allowed to buy beer directly from a brewery. But for some stupid, uneducated reason, we can't buy beer directly from a brewery here in the in the state of Texas. So that was just passed as well in the House, and now it's moving on to the Senate. So today I wanted to invite Rasul, the head of Buffalo Bay Brewing, and Taylor, his right-hand man or woman, I don't know his gender, uh, to discuss what's happening, what's going to happen, um, you know, and, and just kind of figure out what to expect and what not to expect. We also discuss the controversy over me pouring aggressive beers. Uh, for those of you who are part of Houston Bourbon Society, you will see that I will often pour my beer so aggressively that the head initially is like 90% of the glass, and I caught some flack for it. Well, I want you guys to know, spoiler alert, you're wrong, I'm right, and uh, we get some input from Rasul and, and Taylor about it. So um, without further ado, Rasul Zarnfar, Taylor Stevenson of Buffalo Bayou Brewing, and Cheers. Thanks for coming back on, man. Thanks for having me, brother. I'm so glad you guys are here. I know you've, you know, he tells me all the time you watch the show. I don't, I don't know if it's complete nonsense, but. Um, yeah, I don't know if, which show are we talking about again? Oh my God. Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, wait. No, ha- good to be here. Sure, Great. Thank sure. You. Thank what you. What a jerk. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, a lot of stuff's happened in Texas the last week, and I thought it would be great if we got some people in here far more intelligent than I <laughs> to discuss uh, what's happened, what might happen, what's what hasn't happened, because it hasn't been sure. passed yet. Yeah. 
Um, and it might not even make it that far. Yeah. And so I, I'm, I figured we could definitely fill an hour drinking and talking about what's to come in the TABC and, and within Texas. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'll, I'll just say we, we think about what happened and just to retrace some of the steps, right? So, we we tried to go through the front door with this legislation, and uh, to give for those who, of, yeah for those who don't know what legislation are we talking about? Yeah, we're talking about beer to go. So, and what that means is, if you come to my brewery right now, I can sell you a pint of beer that you have to consume there, or a bomber that you have to consume there as well. But if you want to take a six pack and leave with it, you're not able to do that. Now, in across the country, we have fifty states in the U.S. Forty nine of the fifty states allow you to buy beer and leave the premises on a brewery directly from a brewery directly what's from the a one state that doesn't allow the it? one sta- i'm so glad you asked so the one state is a great state of texas which is a state that purports to be pro-business and anti-regulation but if you think about why this regulation exists it's based on some antiquated notions that are still surviving after prohibition just as we see in the whiskey space right sure and now so then if we were to take the in my problem with the, the counter arguments is that they're just not internally consistent. So 49 out of the 50 states allow breweries to buy beer, you're, you're, you, you know, allow you, consumers to buy beer and go from a brewery. Also within Texas, you look at the vertical of, of alcohol. At a distillery, you can buy a bottle and go. At a winery. You can buy two bottles to go. Yeah. Well, thanks for rubbing it in, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you, sell sure. you a teaspoon. So, and so at distilleries, you can, in Texas, at wineries in Texas, you can buy alcohol to go and breweries in every state but Texas. So if you think about like a grid where it's like 49 states, not Texas for beer, and you think about the vertical of alcohol, whiskey, fine, wine, fine. But for some reason, there is a social harm if a brewery is allowed to sell a case of beer out the front door. Well, in, in reality, it's there's not a social harm. It's 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 it. At least within the, the spirit space, it has to do with like the TPSA and, and, and of course, distributors lobbying to, to prevent that because that's taking money out of their pocket. Well, you know, and, I, and and when we use the word distributors, and we talked about this on the last one, sure. I just want to clean up the rhetoric real quick because uh, my, my compatriots are conflating all the entire middle tier. And you know my background in the middle tier. I, 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 I bartended all four years in college. I worked at Silver Eagle for four years, which is the largest Anheuser-Busch distributor on the planet. It. Then uh, after business school, I was turning around a cash flow negative beer distributor in Florida, which was probably the smallest beer distributor on the planet. So I've got a lot of distribution tier experience, and I don't know very many breweries in Texas that have such deep distribution tier experience. And so they get on Facebook or Twitter, and they just push them all together and paint this broad brush, right? For the entire tier. Yeah, for the entire tier. They just kind of poo-poo all their efforts and it it just doesn't make sense, you know? And it's like, okay, well, you know, they're not all the same. So this thing happened a couple months ago, that was super nuanced, right? But the Beer Alliance of Texas, BAT, they actually signed with the Craft Brewers Guild on a, a memorandum of understanding where we laid out some of the frameworks for the deal. And the people in that group are both of my distributors. So, you know, Houston Distributing Company led by Bo Huggins and Faust Distributing Company led by, by Don and Tyson Faust. I mean, these guys are incredible human beings who are, you know, mentors of mine. They're supporters. They, we, we, you know, make our beer and then we ask them to build our brand in the market and go pound the pavement and everything. And they do it, you know, they all day, every day, they're hitting numbers. We're up insane amounts with Faust. I think hundred percent year over year in April. It's yeah. just foolish, just gaudy numbers. Right. And then, and so do our competitors or compatriots or whatever. And then for some reason they get a phone in their hand or they get behind a keyboard and they and want to they, demonize everything. They're just, they just dehumanize the entire tier. I'm you know, pour me a little gin <laughs> it's while we like, talk. And I, I don't know what their image of distributors are. I don't know if they think that, you know, a brewery is Willy Wonka with a bunch of Oompa Loompas running around and, and it's like this magical place. And then the distributors are like this hard driving money grubbers. It's not at all the case. If you know, you can't treat them like FedEx and you can't treat them, you know, poorly, you've got to see them as a partner that they are. 
and 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 understand that you know and you look at deregulated industries such as electronics or uh, oil and gas i mean all, all these deregulated supply chains still have distributors in them because a distributor in a supply chain with a high SKU count breaks bulk and builds bulk and that's their function as a market maker in any in any uh in any in any supply chain sure so, uh, you know, they they have a critical place in the supply chain. They're not just money grubbers. Um, well, h- hold on a second, dude. Let's let's play devil's advocate, and you can and, sure. And, and I'm I'm and I'm I I am not purposely conflating spirits and beer. But I know you're not. Yeah. Uh, but but let's. I I get like all like all people. I I you ever heard that old saying? Sometimes bad people do good things. <laughs> yeah. Right. So meaning we're we're co- we're we're. Um, complicated beings. Sometimes yeah. we make bad decisions. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we do good things. Sometimes we do bad things. Yes, a distributor does a lot of good for brands. Ideally, they're brand builders. That's mm-hmm. the idea. But in a lot of ways, like in this particular case, you have you know a lot of them lobbying to to prevent things like beer to go direct. So the other group, the wholesale the wholesale beer distributors of Texas, WBDT. Uh, from you, you know they are they are not in alignment with our um, with with our strategy moving forward and and I think that there needs to be some pressure on them to come to the table and work within a harmonious situation but you know it's uh, so I I just wanted to take the word wholesaler and kind of break it up break a little it bit. up a little and bit and that's fair. That's yeah. more. In fact, I think that's fair, and it's also the more logical approach. If you said all breweries did this, that would be foolish, right? It would be super foolish. So um, and, I'm and, with you. Yeah, and it should also be known that you know certain breweries do certain things well, and then other things poorly, and then different different distilleries have different relationships with people. So you know, uh, I've got a great relationship with with our two distributors who are just like you know the bedrock and the foundation of our route to market, and uh, some other breweries don't necessarily have that same relationship, even with those individuals. I don't. I don't no, I can't really sure. speak to that. But what I can speak to is they've been good to you, so you're thankful. Yeah, and when I'm and when I'm behind closed doors and talking to these guys and all up and down the 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 org chart at the distributors, there is a uh, or at my two distributors at least my my four, including the the two independents and in, you know Dallas and uh, San Antonio, Hops and Vines and Full Clip. Everyone is a hundred percent bought in on the craft beer movement. They're a hundred percent supportive. You know, they're a hundred percent behind us trying to make sure that we uh, achieve our mission. And, you know, they've got other channel partners, uh, they've got national channel partners and they have to be, uh, that, you know, They've got to be diplomatic and respectful of those relationships, and we're diplomatic and respectful of them as well. I think it's a tic-tac-toe or algebra-based approach to just paint these broad brushes and say these are the big things. But I will say, back in 2013, when we got the ability to sell our beer on our own premises, it came at a high cost. It came at the 11th and a half hour. And it was WBDT coming in and and really doing some scorched earth negotiation tactics through a you know, through a representative, uh, Canona, I believe, and he was voted out in the next election cycle. So what do you mean? <clears throat> what were the things that were done that were scorch earth tactics to, uh, stuff, stuff like making it, um, making certain aspects of co-investment illegal. So marketing practices, and there's this nebulous word capacity in the, in the clause that was created out of that legislative session that, uh, created more gray area than, than black and white. You know, sure. I'm, I'm a man of certainty, right? And so when I think about, uh, w- 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 there's so many things that are hard to navigate in the world. I just want the rules to be straightforward, sure. right? Sure. Like you, you can't, you know, when, when you talk to, when you talk to lawyers, they're as squishy as jellyfish, right? Like, and they look cute and then they sting you or whatever. And you're just like, well, what is it, man? Will you just tell me, like, can I do this or not? Not. So they and were trying to give you. You're saying that they were trying at the at the eleventh hour. They were trying to allow you guys to be able to 
get beer, sell beer on premise. And so we had a good faith negotiation going on along the way. And then at the 11th hour, there was like, okay, this thing, this thing, this thing all happened in committee. And my, my understanding of how it's playing out in Austin right now is that we were at the ninth hour, maybe the 10th hour. So we tried to go through the front door by just offering a clean bill saying, Hey, here's beer to go. Right. And it's stifled in committee. Okay, great. Awesome. I understand how this goes. My understanding is that we had more co-sponsors than we needed yeses on the bill, right? And for some reason, it still doesn't get a, 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 a voice on the floor. Now, I'm not a politician, so I don't really know the ins and outs of it, but you just think about a compelling business case, a compelling consumer case. Uh, we didn't have a retail lobby really coming out against it. I don't think that we are in, we are not in a zero sum relationship with our retailers on this. Like, we're not going to be, um, you're not going to come by the brewery and buy five cases of beer and unless you're only parish. go there. What's that? Unless you're parish. Well, right. I yeah. knew people making pilgr pilgrimages to Louisiana every release of DDH and, and, you know. and so pilgrimage is a key word in that sentence, right? Because <clears throat> what it is, is parish isn't selling at a zero sum with the local supermarket. You know? Sure. So if we get beer to go, for those who aren't following, you're saying that it's not hurting them. They're not. not they're not losing the money retail. by ordering a few cases from the. And, and it's not hurting the distributor either. You're talking about people coming on a voyage over, right? Sure. What we're looking to do is you got a four pack of cowbell and a bananas, a bomber of bananas foster. And maybe you come over, you know, at one of our big parties, like, you know, we've got the carnival coming up May 11th. It's going to be awesome. I expect to see you there, sir. So I, I haven't gotten that invite yet, but I did. What the fuck, Taylor? All right. So this time <laughs> I know that Chris was just going to ignore it. So I know that I've got up until the last minute to send it anyway and just oh say God. otherwise. I, I don't ignore email. I, I just, I genuinely didn't get it this one. So but for May the listeners, we had a little off. bit of a kerfuffle over the anniversary party where- I would uh, have loved to have gone too. Oh my God, what a princess. She uh, whiz. So for future reference, do you need <laughs> eight weeks or 16 weeks notice? I just take a ruler and double check, <laughs> yeah. double check right. my email address. All right, all right. And, <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, I do, I do need a little advance notice because my schedule is a bit crazy yeah, I, right yeah. now. My next three weeks are scheduled out. Yeah. We um, use that same excuse to brush everybody else we're, off we're too. But, but I genuinely so didn't hurt. get your email I'm so before oh, you, I'm yeah. hurt. I didn't even get it. He just said he didn't give me the invite. No, not for May 11th for the uh, carnival party. You not yet. You, not yet. No, oh, yeah. not yet. Oh, he hasn't sent any invites out. So that's okay. All. Okay. <laughs> all right. We're playing reverse hard to get, which oh. I don't know what that actually means, but we're <laughs> sure. going to try it. Well, let me know. Uh, we, my wife and I really try, you know, the last few years with having kids, we don't get a lot of us time to go out. Yeah. So we do try to capitalize yeah. on those date nights whenever we can. And uh, going to a brewery is always just fantastic. Well, the cool thing about this is we're actually going to have uh, you know inflatable it, right? axe throwing. We're going to have a uh, dunk tank. We're going to have a uh, uh, home, home run derby. We're going to have axe throwing? Yeah. Inflatable um, axe throwing. That's This is why. I, oh, yeah. We've got uh, How does that work? hoops you from Hell Challenge. axe at a balloon? Yeah. And um, I mean, we only, what, the budget for the party was around 65 grand. And I think we spent <laughs> all of that. On replacing the inflatables that we're throwing we out. We literally had the a weekly time. sink yesterday, and I was like, "Where's the carnival packet? I don't even know what uh, events are at the carnival." Like, and then I yeah, find out you're going to be underwater live, the entire on time. Live radio. Oh yeah. I mean, it's not live, although we're not going to edit anything out. So I guess yeah. it's the same thing. But uh, so that way also, <laughs> if your kids ever piss you off, you can just have all these pictures of you playing these awesome, fun carnival games out there and uh, show it to them and be like. This is what happens when you're bad. You, you know don't what? get to do this. You actually bring up two questions I want to ask you about. Let, first, I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm going to ask these in a different order only because I don't want to get too far away from what we were just talking about. Sure. The, the coconut has faded a little bit, so I'm interested oh, to see. I'm interested to see your coconut thoughts on it. fades so quickly. That's why you have to boost it with vanilla so that 30 days later you still have a coconut flavor. Because coconut isn't really coconut. It's really vanilla plus other things. Oh, well. Look at Duh. this guy. Wow. That's why you got to... That's why I'm a C player. Um, yeah, ready, that's why, set... That's why th if you're going to brew an adjunct collaboration, bring with the guys who do it all day. Drink, uh, hey, I can't... Okay. <laughs> Press record right now. Press record right now. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> what? I, no. I came to you oh first. Oh, my God. I gaslit so I, bad, I, didn't I? I came oh, to you first. I deserve you remember? It. You I walked me through it. your warehouse. I know. I, I know. saw other people I having you. barrel... Reserve 101, of all places, had a barrel of beer aging in his warehouse. I was like... All right. All right. All right. This is nice. I love you, Chris. <laughs> I love you so much. Don't mess with the fro. <laughs> <laughs>
So no, yes, that was my whole thing. Is I I yes, came right. to Rasul first. I know, I know. I and know. you know what I got? I got a no and, and a six cool. pack of beer. No, it wasn't. And the a beer no. was reindeer tears. No, you know so. what? It, oh, <laughs> Chris, it, it wasn't a no. It wasn't a no. It was a. I don't make promises that I can't knock out. Of sure. The and it was a situation where in the moment, in the new facility, we'll be able to do this and we'll be able to give you exactly the liquid that I can, because uh, I've got such deep respect for you and your palate and everything that you've Not built with the community. <laughs> He's going to be like, Ugh, never mind. Disregard. Take everything back. No, I nah. love everything that Southern Star does. And, and Southern Star does barrel aging incredibly well. Black crack every year. I look forward to it, you know? So I don't, you, you know, it's just a situation where I knew that if I had said yes, I would have under executed and I would have felt horrible about it because I deeply, deeply respect you. So when I when we say yes, when we're ready, yeah, we're gonna I'm knock down. it out of the mother friggin' park. I'm just I'm just making sure that you know <laughs> you that I came to you first. Wow. Wow. Come on, wow. that I came I came to you first. I just want to make sure it was yes. known. I, um, and then I got you. Oh you know, yes. I'll give you one of these too. So awesome. Um, and listen, oh, I try to be f respectfully critical when possible. I did not enjoy last year's Black Crack, but I will say that they put their buried hatchet in our barrels, and it turned out fantastic at the time. In fact, it's their number one rated beer on Untapped. Great. I don't know what the coconut was before, but I like the balance on that. The coconut. Uh, so my first thought when it, when we when it was first canned was it was too little too much coconut. I didn't. I was a little like, oof, we got to tone it down next year. A little but too much. You said a little too much coconut. Okay. And, and it's and it's, it's been toned down since then, uh, and I actually really enjoy it. How did y'all treat the coconut before uh, bringing it in? Uh, you you have to talk it? to them. Yeah, you have to talk to them. So I I simply had the idea, and we want I wanted to do this. The original idea for this was to do a peanut butter stout. And I don't know of anyone doing it. And I love belching beavers. Yeah, we've done that a couple of times. Uh, well, sorry. Yeah, we, we've Turkey, only I done know, it, you know. Tur mm, turtle water. Water. I know. I know. You guys have done it a couple of times. You, but you're the only ones I know that have done it um, mm -hmm. in the bottle. And yeah. I, I wanted to try to get our own little using our bourbon barrels. Sure. Yeah. And uh, you got to have formula approval for it. I was like, eh, just let's go the easier route and just do the label approval. Of course you need formula approval for it. Yes. Well, speaking of which, I need to uh, forward this email I got from TTB about not being able to do legalize again. Sorry about that. Oh, well. Not, not being able to do what? You know, we, you know we're recording we, just for the record. Yeah, that's okay. fine. <laughs> we, we ask for forgiveness, not permission when sure. it comes to ingredients because my, my – my approach to that is the regulators and the definers are always one step behind the sure. creatives, right? So we're always pushing new ground. We're engaging new ideas and they're always going to be a step behind. So they're coming at it from a health and safety perspective sure. and a truth and advertising perspective. What, what was this again? Which beer? Uh, Legalize. We we use uh, hemp seeds that we sourced out of Canada. and uh, That's against and, the law? What's that? Hemp seeds against the law? It's not against the law. You have to go through a formula approval, and we uh, we took a different interpretation of the law. So TTB says you don't need uh, TTB approval if you're not selling outside of Texas. So we relied on that on that as a as a go on ahead that safe harbor. Sure. But back to the point about you know legislatures, laws, and lawyers being squishy ass jellyfish that sting you after they look cute, right? Sure. It's like okay, well, which uh, which part of the code are you going to interpret today? Because because I was expecting it to be this sentence, which is pretty clear. Turns out it's an interpretation of that sentence. Uh, you know, well, so. that's the biggest problem with all regulations is interpretation. But uh, before we took our break, which you can just leave that part in, you don't have to cut that part out because we kind of jumped into a. If you just do a hard cut and we're in a whole new conversation, it's a bit <laughs> weird. Um, two two things. Uh, I had two questions. My going back to what we were talking about before. What are your thoughts? Uh, do you get nervous when you hear like Parrish coming to, to Texas? I mean, the excitement was a bit no, for, not for, at all. Not, not at all. So first of all, because we you guys don't see it as well, we were beer nerds before yeah. we started the brewery. So it's super exciting. Yeah. The thing about it is, look, here's the thing: we, my favorite beer that we've ever made is Figaro, an 11 percent Belgian quad aged on Turkish figs. I think it's phenomenal. It's beautiful, right? We were putting it on a shelf next to all these amazing Belgian beers and I'm asking you to buy my beer instead of, you know, I mean, Meritsu 10 or, you know, uh, or, 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 or other equivalent offerings, other equivalent offerings that have been around for four or 500 years that are brewing beer the right way. And they care about it immensely. Right, you're not worried about so, the next hazy coming to market. No, I mean, no. one thing that's great about craft beer in general is that, you know, people get stuck in it being a, a microcosm and that's as far as their vision gets. You know, everybody talks about how many 
many craft breweries are all over the place. You know, look at a place like San Diego, which is not it does not have a huge population. And they still, worry about saturation. Yeah, they're, it's but still we haven't able. Hit it yet. We're still good. Well, I mean, San Diego isn't even worried about it. The, that's the problem is that you know everybody gets so uh, enveloped with what they can perceive immediately, and they don't realize that there's you know seven seven and a half billion people on this earth. There's not going to be enough craft breweries. There's not going to be enough distilleries to to ever really oversaturate things as long as it's planned properly. Yeah, and every, every year we have a team meeting and I present the same poem to the team every single year. It's a poem called Why by Nanao Sakaki and it's about climbing a mountain. And uh, at the end of the poem, you get to realize that you weren't climbing a mountain, you were just really fighting yourself up the mountain. And our definition of competition is it's always you versus yourself. Everyone else is irrelevant. So if you handle your plan, if you lay it out, and then it's you versus yourself, and you execute to your standards, competition is irrelevant. And we've seen this time and time again across all the different industries. But what often happens is people are looking this way or they're looking this way, right? They're looking out a window instead of in the mirror to use Jim Collins' uh, metaphor from uh, great, uh, good to great. You know, A great manager looks in the mirror, not out the window. And you don't blame and you don't de defer. It's you versus yourself. So if you you know, parish moves in, another person moves in, another person moves in, right? If you are enjoying their beer more than ours, it's probably a situation where we didn't execute more cowbell the way we wanted to execute it. Our beer, I, th I think, is uh, it, 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 when we nail what we're trying to nail, we're, we're the best in the business and there's nothing else to be talking about, you know? Yeah. Even, oh, sorry. Even beyond that, I mean, you look at I, – I love Ghost in the Machine. It's a, a great IPA in its own right. But if you don't have that much experience with craft beer and you find something that is that high of quality right off the bat, then all that does is it, it makes more people come into craft beer, which it's then – It's inspiring. Yeah. The, the third, fourth, fifth beer they might try might be Cowbell. And then they turn around and they're like, oh, my God, this is fantastic. And it's – it's everything is a gateway for each other. A rising tide uh, raises all ships. Well, it, 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 and it's not just that because there are some ships that are built the wrong way. And they need to fail. The sign of a healthy market, the sign of a healthy forest is forest fires. The sign of a healthy market and healthy competition is losers. There need to be losers. We've sure. had we've had some breweries go out of business here in Texas, and you know it was a situation where if you cut quality corners uh, and on a a recurring basis, yeah, that that's how it's going to happen. You know, uh, it, it's good, and and you want you want your customer to be discerning because if they are discerning, then A players get A marks and C players get C marks. Sure, you know? but if and if they're not discerning, then it's just random. Sure, and you can't win the game. So when Ghost Against the Machine comes in, and you know <laughs> we're enjoying it, we're just drinking it for ourselves because we're sure. having fun with it. You know, I like to say we're a banana factory run by a bunch of monkeys. So, you know, when there's another banana, you're like, oh, man, I love bananas. You sure, know? sure. Yeah. And, no comment. And, 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 yeah. <laughs> well played. But, you know, and I, I like the way you frame that. I hadn't heard you frame it like that. But that's a really good point where if they set a high standard for a bar, then that's going to cut other people out. And then the saturation, it figures itself out, right? Markets normalize. What isn't acceptable for competition is for Anheuser-Busch to buy out SAB Miller, the largest brewery on the planet, buys out the second largest brewery on the planet. And then they come here in Texas and they buy out the largest craft brewery in, in Carbach. And the DOJ is asleep at the wheel. So you have a major player with unlimited resources who has – absolutely decimated the beer scene in uh, Brazil by creating a monopoly. And then they, when they bought out Interbrew, they drove Bex into the ground and Bass is no longer relevant. And where's Leffa now? And Stella is like a mass marketing machine with no identity. It, they, they really ruined those, those things. And then they come and buy out Anheuser-Busch and they're, you know, reverse Midas touch. 17 of the top 19 executives are gone in the first 30 days that InBev buys out Anheuser-Busch. And it's a shell of its former self with no innovative products, no innovative marketing, no leadership, no nothing, just cost reductions. Then they go with Goose Island and they decimate it, leaving it 
a shell of its former self. I had the misfortune of dining at both Eleven uh, or Ten Barrel and uh, Elysian a couple of months ago, and they were miserable experiences, completely off the mark. This is what's going to happen if the DOJ continues to allow a monopolistic uh, thinker to just buy up all the big players and buy up all the little players. That's why you know, everyone asks me, like, why is this Carbach buyout such a big deal? I like the guys. I like the guys too. They're good people, especially in the middle and the lower ranks. Like, you, you know, we've, <laughs> we've poached a couple and they're, they're, they're wonderful human beings. And I've got nothing to say about the owners and their decision. But as we think about what is an industry that we want to support, what do we want to look like, right? When they buy a small brewery and then make contracts like at, you know, at, uh, at sports venues where I have to pay a minimum of $250,000 just to be pouring beer at that sports venue, you know, um, not to name names, but when Maybe. they, when they engage in illegal activity like pay to play, when they run a lost leader on their, uh, ads with this retailer and that retailer and then try and get small, less profitable companies to just, you know, cause they don't need to run a profit off a of car box. So they can just kind of run it, run us into the ground by, uh, semi illegal activity and pay sure. to play all over the place. You know, when you've got a, a, a player like that, that is distorting competition and ruining innovation across literally the planet. And then the department of justice is like, what the hell man yeah, yeah, yeah. like you block this you block that you block this over here but for beer a single player can have an 80 share across the planet come on man that dog don't hunt it's not internally consistent and so that that's the issue and then what you know that's why i think you know i don't mean to play miss cleo he said that dog don't hunt that dog don't hunt oh did you think he said a cuss word Oh, I thought you were writing down. No. I thought you might have heard something else besides Do you hunt. know how hard I'm trying not to drop F-bombs? Especially, did can you we just clear the air on this personal the beef? cadence? When you had TJ Miller on here after you told me I wasn't allowed to swear and I followed the rules. You did not then, follow the rules. Every segment you said the F-word. What? What? Every segment you said the F word. It was it was the I most F words we had to date up to that point. Or so. I don't know. It's pretty darn close. Oh, but I was really? like, hey, just don't say it in every segment. He was like, every, at the end of I'm going to have segment. to see the transcript on that one. Someone called a stenographer. That's bullshit. Yeah. I mean, that's ah. BS. Yeah. So when Anyways, TJ was on, I didn't so. want to, I just let him do what he wanted. There was, we go. Was, I, yeah. was, I was happy to have him on. No, he was fun. awesome. He sat in that chair. That's your, your butt, oh, your butt oh, tingling. Man. Really? <laughs> oh, that's horrible. That's horrible. I need another drink. <laughs> Anyways, so I'll uh, partake. Yeah, that's I'm gonna uh, need something after yeah, that. No, so no. I, I did bring some scotch. I don't know if you guys are. I, so so Treaty Oak also sent me some bourbon, and uh, I honestly like a good barrel aged gin. So a sipping hmm. gin. These these gins have a sweetness to them. It kind of tastes like cocktail in a bottle. But uh, I'm that's drinking awesome. a gin right now. My that's first drink of the show. I, lo I love gin. Yeah. So just to finish the diet. Sure. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. no. 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 I literally distracted myself as I often do, but. No, what happened – so then when the DOJ is asleep at the wheel in D.C., then the pressure moves here to Austin and the wholesalers are very rightfully thinking, what are all these tectonic shifts that are happening? Sure. And we can't trust the government regulators to, to do what they're supposed to do, at least not the um, – not the financially minded ones, right? The right. antitrust laws are not being are honored not being honored yeah, or yeah. enforced, or neither the letter or the spirit of the law, right? So, of course, distributors are then looking at their backyard and their like livelihood and saying, "Well, this is happening there, and this is happening there, and this is happening there, and every and the internet's happening to music industry, and this is happening to this, and disruptions everywhere." You know, and then Amazon's moving in and, you know, Warren Buffett and McLean is trying to get in and Costco is trying to sell, you know, with all that and Walmart's trying to move. It's, it's just all these tectonic shifts are, are moving and it's, it's hard to figure out which way is up. They're just looking for some certainty. Sure. And so when the BAT sat down with the Craft Brewer, Brewers Guild, one of my favorite parts of that joint memorandum was a moratorium on future changes. And the idea is like, look, guys, this is – and you, you can hear it just in the way that they described it. They're like, look, this is it. So we're just going to – so you're, you're cool and you're cool. We're cool. We're cool. 
let's just leave it for a decade and just agree not to get in each other's throats every two years playing this game where it's like, as soon as the session ends, we're gearing up and getting those Facebook likes so that we can have the engine to go blow up people's personal cell phones when it's time to, to get this dog and pony show going, you know? And, and so I think it's a very natural and understandable and, and, and reasonable reaction to all of this change and uncertainty to say, can I just have something I can hold on to? Some, some just solid ground sure. on which I can plan my business more than two in more than two hours. Two years is not a, a capital planning cycle. You bring up a couple points. I will say, I think 10 may be too long, but I think two is way too short. I think they should at least leave it for a good five, six, you know, years. The, my problem is, is that we've seen so often in the past, uh, like, for instance, I think it was 2000, and I'm going to be butchering timelines here, but yeah, just sure. bear with me. That's fine. Just right after 2010, the Heights made a vote to to mm -hmm. make it wet again because it's been dry for a century. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was almost universally shot down. And then literally just a couple years later, uh, the vote came up again, I think two years ago, and, and, mm -hmm. and it was passed almost universally. So just the change in times yeah. and 10, a lot can happen in 10 years. The public's perception of how things should happen. Absolutely. Marijuana, right? Mm -hmm. We're like right on the precipice of legalizing it in the state. It keeps coming up from time to time. Um, I think 10 might be too long, but I'm with you with on everything else. I had two questions earlier I want to come back to. So yeah. I asked you about Parrish. We're in agreement. I didn't think you guys would look at it that way, but what are well, your it, thoughts it should also be noted that I have such immense respect for them and they do business what I call the right way and they share our, our ethics and their ethos and, and that's it. Who are they distributing through? Uh, you know, is it Flood? I can't remember if it's Flood or Benny Keith. Yeah, I don't. I don't really pay attention to that. But I know they are Again, it's they us are getting us yeah, some, market sure. presence. And I mean, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier about uh, actual sales from the brewery and, you know, people going to the parish and making those huge runs and coming back for other people. I mean, think about it this way. How does anybody know what, what they're looking at when they're in that supermarket and what they want to buy if they hadn't even heard hype around it? Much less, you know, there's only going to be a certain amount of people that get to drink that liquid that gets brought back. But just the hype created about it, it's uh, this this kind of grassroots word of mouth uh, advertising. That, so when it finally does yeah. hit retail shelves, it's it's yeah. a, it's, a, it's, it's a, not an unknown quantity. It's that's a very good that's point that I've never heard anybody bring already. up. Sorry to completely talk <laughs> over you, but uh, I've never I'm heard anyone bring that up. <laughs> I'm I'm kidding. No, but I mean that's one is thing. Is he that, kidding though? Is he kidding? <laughs> that's one thing that uh, we were talking about earlier. Where you know a lot of people, if it's direct competition, um, only the people that are going to succeed in the end are the ones that are going to rise above it or or work with it or use it, use it to their advantage. Uh, craft beer. We've got a ton of of nerds. We've got a ton of people just out in the general public that that are aware of what craft beer is it's still a very, very small segment. And all we can do is grow. And the only way we're going to grow is by awareness. And and this is just one of the many factors that's going to increase that awareness. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think it's completely dumb that we can't, you can't just simply go up there. I, I experienced that myself not too long ago. I, I came to your place. You weren't there. You were out of town or whatever, uh, but I, it's okay. Yeah, I know. All these stories happen when nobody's Real around. piece of shit. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I ordered, uh, I was like, oh, they had all these bombers for sale. I was like, oh, I'll take six of these. And he's yeah. like, oh, you got to check them all here. I was like, uh. And you did it anyway. No, I didn't. Oh. And, and then it's, and then, you know, then what's heartbreaking is you then say, well, where can I get them? And I can tell you six different places that may have one of them. And that's why it's not zero sum against our retailers. It's not like you were then going to turn around and go to HEB or Specs or, or Kroger and, and get them because they have inventory holding needs that they need to, to, to figure out, right? So we can hold 20 SKUs in our inventory and not have a problem with it. They can't. That's not their business model, right? So if you want like a three-year-old beer that I have in my personal cellar, I want the ability to get it in your hands somehow. And I, it's such a small amount of profit that I don't care about. 
the cash about it. I care about the hospitality aspect of it. You know, the get, getting you to feel really, or, you know, it's essentially you, a marketing expense. Yeah, it's not just a marketing expense, but also just like make my customers happy. That, that's the only well, I mean, reason we exist on this planet. Like we we founded a brewery because we love beer. No one was making the beer that we wanted to drink. No one was taking creative risks that were thoughtful, flavor theory driven, and really breaking down the component ideas and rebuilding flavor profiles in a beer much the way that a chef builds flavor profiles in a dish no one was doing that and i still think that uh that most 95 percent of breweries in texas still aren't doing that and not taking a like ingredient based approach you know even just well i I don't want to make any comments but (laughs) uh certainly not about anyone tangible so just keeping it abstract i would just say that you have to meet the ingredients on their own terms and work with them in that sort of way and and really i mean i was interviewing a chef literally an hour ago and we were talking about basil and uh he want he wanted to put basil in a dish and i or he was talking about a drink that he had with basil and i was like what type of basil and he's like uh and i, I guess maybe you know american basil and i was like okay well when we did with the f which is uh lemon basil and a couple of other little uh, accents we engage the basil in its entirety so there's thai basil there's french basil there's italian basil there's texas basil we finish on with a uh, sweet california basil and that's just selecting the ingredient let alone how you were to treat it introduce it and work it into the aromatics the beer, or the yeah. mouthfeel of the beer which is a very scientific thing so uh yeah, so that didn't go well, but <laughs> you, you know. So, but so hope we, he's not watching. Yeah, well, yeah. And this is the third segment or the fourth. Okay, good, good, good. Because uh, there's there's so so much more I want to talk to you about, but I want to make sure we're not running out of time. Yeah. The one aspect of what I was going to mention specifically was uh, Walmart and Amazon. Yeah. So, are you guys nervous about that at all, or is that a that, I would think as a supplier, you guys in the beer world, you guys are considered suppliers, right? So, what, would would you guys be mm, manufacturers? Yes. I mean, look, you, you have to be – when it comes to corporate strategy, it, it all comes down to internal alignment, right? And so when you study you study the losers and the winners of disrupted markets, the, the recurring thing is that you can't predict their disruption. It's just not physically possible, right? So it's the people who have built an intellectual – an intellectual brain trust at the top tier that with, you know, best athletes with flexible thinkers who understand the ins and outs and the, and the, and the real theory of it. And then the feedback loops, experiment, learn, experiment, learn, adapt. And, you know, one of my favorite slides that I present every year in our team meeting has the scientific loop where, you know, the, uh, a learn, we call it the learning loop. It's a scientific process. And then the final picture is Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote. And there's Wiley Coyote just about to die going off the Grand Canyon or off a cliff. And adaptation is a, nece- is a most necessary step. Right. And the only way for adaptation to happen is for a hypothesis based approach to experimentation in the business at the business model level. And we have we have a strong balance sheet. We have a strong income statement. We have a strong management team. We have an incredible middle management team. We're fungible. I'm not afraid of anyone. If they're able to come in and do this, then we'll do this, and we'll you know we'll have a mind like water that fills the gaps. And but it, that, but it's that's a it's key. a good it's good overall though, right? I mean, and there well, there would be no concerns. I mean, I get it that when the subject comes up of let's say Paris coming into the state, some. Not you, but some could make the argument, oh my gosh, if we're already worried about the next new pop-up brewery in Houston being saturation, now we're bringing in out-of-state beers. If you were worried about the next pop-up brewery coming out of Houston, then your house wasn't built on a strong enough foundation in the first place. Sure, but that's that's separate from the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is simply that um, I don't see any reason why any beer manufacturer would be – Upset at the idea of Walmart or well, not Walmart. Um, again, I'm thinking of spirits, Amazon, but yeah. Amazon being able to to you know carry your beer and obviously sell a, a shit ton of it. Well, I actually don't love Amazon's uh, monopolistic practices across the country. You know, when they were backed by Kleiner Perkins, they had the runway for I think it was like 15 years. I mean, I understand J curves, right? So you invest in an unprofitable business and then surge and get the revenues up at the top, but they've been 
diving down that J curve over and over and over again. So because they were privately backed by Kleiner Perkins and a, you know, a bunch of VCs and private equity firms, right? They were able to go so deep into the J curve that they were able to, I think, unfairly compete against someone like Barnes and Noble who has uh, actual earnings needs, you know? Sure. So maybe the, maybe the, the right way for borders to have tried to stay alive is to then f- privatize, uh, scoop into the J curve with, with, uh, with deep pockets and then just go down a death ride with Amazon. But we are seeing price competition on crack with an, and, and, a, and an elimination of the buying experience for consumers. So it's a reduction of choice rather than an expansion of choice. I guess that's a thesis that I kind of glossed over. Every single thing, every single competitive move that increases consumer choice and increases a quality that gets to the consumer is by default, de facto, a good thing for perfect competition. That's a definition of it. And if we can't meet those standards, then we are out of business and we have to meet those standards. If you want your beer to be like this, if you want this quality, you want this, we have to meet that. We can't just, we can't just shy away from that challenge, right? And the thing with Amazon is they're able to go so deeply negative and, 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 and all that through some artificial competitive practices. They need to be broken up, I believe. That's a, that's a personal thing. Sure. When you're talking about Walmart, they are still very much working within the framework of um, very normal competitive practices. Sure. They get price competition by eliminating all waste in the supply chain. Do they do all the practices I love? You know, not necessarily, but they they are uh, coming to craft beer now. We're, we're going to have uh, three placements in nine stores in the next like 60 days. This is the first time that we've sold at Walmart. There's uh, talk about them wanting to go up the value chain a little bit more. You know, we've seen them respond going up the value chain uh, in a lot of different other industries and a lot of different other uh, cities and metros. And and then the pressure the the pressure that Amazon's exerting on Whole Foods has been really interesting to watch the supermarket tier, which has been stagnant for quite some time, you know. So I, I don't see these as necessarily existential threats. I see these as excuses for C players to use when they go out of business. But, sure. I do know if I get home and my Prime subscription is canceled by Amazon. You're, you're life, putting too yeah, much faith in this. No. <laughs> It's mm-mm, mm-mm. Oh, no. yeah, and I, I buy a lot from Amazon, you know. So, but I, I do think you you think about how they're able to uh, not have to worry about being profitable and just take uh, wheelbarrows of investment from uh, from VC firms that are betting on the betting on the come, you know. Sure. And and in doing so, they're able to push a lot of traditional brick and mortars completely out of of business. We know what's going to happen. We know this book. The next thing they do, once they have a monopoly, the first thing they're going to do is increase price. They're going to increase the cost to the suppliers and say, you have to pay to play to be on our on our platform, then they're gonna then they're gonna drop price, drop price, drop price, and uh, to to push others out, and then they're gonna build price again to then uh, maximize profit out of your pocket. And this is very standard mon- monopolistic practices. It's a very easy playbook to to predict. If the Department of Justice is asleep at the wheel like they were for Anheuser Busch buying SAB Miller, and they're asleep at the wheel with Amazon, and they don't break them up. We're going to be in a tough competitive situation, right? But that's across all categories, you know? Sure. So, anyways, enough of that. We're supposed to be is, talking about whiskey. Yeah, is well, that you a, led, yeah. You led Tell with, us how you really feel. Well, um, you, you led with inside baseball on the legislation. So, I guess I'm just in like work mode. Well, and we're going to come back so, to that too. But yeah. I do want to, I haven't actually tried the Dream Sickle. Can we actually oh, open yeah. one of these? Oh, man. So, Are we opening this from the top or the side? Mm, that's what does right. that mean? Oh, <laughs> oh so, I, I think you know that, Trebek. Definitely you know? don't do that. Oh, come on, come on. <laughs> so, you know, some people say the come and crush it flag is upside down, but I think it's right side up if you're drinking it right. <laughs> so, Yeah, so this is actually a blonde. We've got a little bit of, oh, go ahead. I go just ahead. realized I'm yeah, not going to interrupt you. You just, oh, I, yes, That's exactly what yes. I want to talk about. I want to talk about this right here. The aggressive pour for bloating. Nice. Yeah. Good form, sir. So, you obviously are a habitual over aggressive pour there. Yeah, so you got it down. I mean, I definitely. <laughs> That's better than what I was thinking. Let's, let's, 
let's let's do this because I would love the feedback and the argument to finally defend myself uh, visually as opposed to goddamn Facebook. But I am a uh, I started with with craft beer, but mm-hmm. I was putting on weight, I was starting to get a little man titties, right? Yeah, and uh, I switched to whiskey. Around the same time as the, the story I tell all the time about how I met my or how I finally got on my father in law's good graces <laughs> over a bottle of whiskey, but I was aggressively pouring to get rid of a lot of that carbonation because the bloating, right? If you work at a desk job, which a lot of us uh, who drink beer, well, I might be painting with a broad brush here, but when I worked blue collar work, right, out in the heat, I used to work for a welding company. Uh, you will crush. Uh, beer after you get off yeah. but sitting behind a desk the past 10 years dealing in aviation my stomach has shrunk right i mean i'm not eating uh, super big meals anymore because all i do is i'm very sedentary that's what i'm trying to get to beer is very bloating right and i based off the words of a uh master cicerone right i i I started aggressively pouring to just break up that head, get some of that carbonation out. Now, I sit here and I drink it. It only took a few seconds to settle. That's a good head right there. That's normal. And yeah, I just feel less a, bloated, right? So just, th- there's a few things that go along with that. I mean, for Snobbery is number one, but go ahead. Well, one, I also want to, you know, go back to, yes, we all understand you don't crush beers at your new job behind your desk <laughs> no. anymore like you used to. You don't do cry me. yourself. No, 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 no. I was never, of- never saying that I crushed it at my old job either, but just saying <laughs> that I, I had more room in the stomach yeah, back yeah, when no, I was you, up and moving around more. There is a certain amount of conditioning that goes into it. I mean, Frank the Tank wasn't born Frank the Tank. Sure. He <laughs> became Frank the Tank. That's not what Frank would say. Yeah, well. <laughs> I was born this way. <laughs> but um, yeah, so actually, I mean, it, it's really, in the end, uh, it's however you want to consume it to get what you want out of the beer. I mean, that's, Really, the the first thing that you can always do going into it is say, how am I going to enjoy this beer? Do not cut yourself off from doing it a certain way because you still want to experience that. But in the, at the end of the day, you're an aggressive pour. We'll find other ways to hate on you. And, it doesn't <laughs> matter. But Trust also, me, it's very easy. And, and, and ju- just to take it from a flavor perspective, though, I would just say we build our beers to be super aromatic. So we are we think about the beer in a couple of different ways. We're thinking as it greets you, leaping out of the glass, how does it roll around in your mouth? Don't do it. And then the finish, right? Like how how does it leave and how does it, does it linger? So an aggressive <laughs> pour would only lead to agitation for more aromatics then. Well, so, so I love aggressively pouring a lot of different ones of our beers, right? So Figaro, for instance, the aromatics are just so beautiful. The esters coming off of that, that Belgian yeast strain are just so glorious. You've got to pour hard and it's got to be aromatic. Now, the opposite of that is that Figaro is also, it has this like beautiful kind of raisiny, uh, viscous mouth feel Agreed. that's very velvety. And we build that very deliberately, right? So for that beer to be a little more still, for gingerbread stout to be a little more still, wonderful. This beer, uh, it's going to be, we, we want it to be effervescent, you know? So I, I understand you may use the word bloating. I would have not used the word bloating, but uh, and I don't work in beer marketing. Yeah, there we go. So, but but you'll you'll see it. I mean, you saw you saw it with the gin, maybe. But like, I mean, the first thing I sure. do is I swirl the bejesus out of it, and and I spend almost more time like smelling the beer than I do drinking it because I just, especially this one. I mean, I don't know what you're getting, but I get this beautiful orange marmalade. It's just like it takes me back to like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that my mom would make when I was like ten years old, you know. And it's just like. Oh, it's so beautiful. And I actually get made fun of because I'll I'll end up like getting beer in my nose on a regular basis because I'm sure. just like, oh, yeah. it's just, oh, it's so good. And it's just, I mean, this beer is just so gloriously, beautifully aromatic that a hard pour is great for it if you're going to drink it fast. Right. The challenge mm-hmm. is if this beer is warm and flat because you poured it too hard on the front end. But I'm not sipping over 50, I'm not it's not going to take me 20 minutes to drink this beer, right? My and we've got to take a quick break. I don't believe it's over. See it. it depends what else you're drinking at the same time also. Sure. Okay. I think about quality as gratitude to our customers. And so for me, the the sound of a can popping open is probably one of the most amazing sounds. Like, okay. The There's world. one sound better and that's the sound of release. a cork. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was oh, like, wait, might... 
what are we talking about again? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it didn't work we, that time. We but. may disagree on that. But so the way I describe it is like, okay, so more cowbell, it, the brand is a promise and you get home and you've had a hard day and you pop open that that top. That's a pretty and, good sound. And you hear that and you just hear, you hear this right here and you're just like, the day's over. My blood pressure is dropping. Now, this liquid that's in this can, it is my job, it is my life's work to make sure that it's predictable and exactly what you want it to be so that in your self-imposed therapy session, right, that it, it, it greets you on your day, on your terms, rather than like if you're at the end of a long day and you hear that beautiful sound and then the beer doesn't taste right and you're like – Come on, man. I just can't win today. It's like it just doesn't get well, better. Sometimes though. it also really helps you get going when you first get into the office and – Wait, what? <laughs> and then all of a sudden yeah. it's like, all oh, right, <laughs> okay. weekly marketing meeting. Okay, yeah, just because we were talking about this being therapy doesn't mean we make it therapy. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so just so we're clear, you're you're okay with an aggressive See, look at this. Pour. Your muffin top just went, uh, just went away. See, I still got oh. my oh. – So you're okay with an aggressive pour as long as you don't let it sit too long and go flat? Look, Chris. I, I want no. Uh, give me no. the full judgmental. No, it's not judgmental, and I'm, you're not going to get it from me because at the end of the day, we're not wine. Wine is about stuffy, like stuffy. The craft beer can BS. be quite be that way, and I especially tell, online. And I tell them to Chris calm Morris, down. You son of a and bitch. I tell them to calm down. I tell them to back off, and I tell them, dude, it's beer. Get over yourself. I, well, that's so, what I think has happened, especially with glassware. Right, the, the number of different glass style shapes that have come out. This right so, here, right. Let me yeah. just let me let me go. On a on a sure. on a yes a, absolutely a Rasul diatribe for a second. Let's do it. <laughs> this is essentially a stemmed Glen Cairn. Okay, yeah. but the people who created this glass created it specifically for literally cognac, grappa, every distilled spirit other than whiskey. Didn't even mention it. Didn't address it. Yeah, but it is the exact same shape, almost the exact same diameter up top. Same form and function. You 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 kind of um, choke the top of the glass to kind of funnel the aromatic straight up the nose. We're all on the same page, right? Yeah. I posted this online. Someone said that's not a whiskey glass. That's a grappa glass. And I, and I wanted to jump through my computer screen and punch this man <laughs> who was clearly um, yeah. uh, retired and stayed at home a lot yeah. uh, in his face because it's such a stupid. Unimportant argument, man. This is, this is where I come from when I'm talking about flavor theory and really just theory in general. So if you have taken the time to really understand all the physics and the chemistry and the biology that's happening, right? You're talking about the curvature of the glass, right? What we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to do a bunch of different things. We're trying to increase the surface area. We're trying to restrict the things. If you do a hard pour in a Libby pint glass versus this beautiful tulip you, and then you drink that dream you will have completely different experiences in either glass. Does that make one or the other right? That's not that's not what I do. I'm not going to come in and tell you that the way you want to enjoy it, the beer that you purchase, I'm not going to tell you that you're right or wrong. It, 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 Unless just, we're talking about you, Chris, you are wrong. But that's yeah. my, that's no, my, that's but that, my that's frustration. That's more of a personally the... derisive point oh, than a uh, philosophical yeah, we're point. Talking about so what not. you're describing to me is what really frustrates me. And we see this with our compatriots as well, especially when they criticize us. It's like, okay, so if you take the time to explore the ins and outs of the idea and you've derived it and then you can come in. In, and you can say, you know what, this serves all of my needs, so I'm going to make it a whiskey glass. Sure. Right? But what you have is, like I said, that you know, create people who are creative and pushing the envelope. The definers are always a step behind, right? So you know, when Miles Davis released "Kind of Blue" in 1959, didn't win a Grammy, most amazing. You just said something really, really pretty, really beautiful. You just said that you anyone pushing the envelope, doing something outside the norm, the definers are always a step. They're behind. always a step behind. The the but that's the same with the. The, change the word definers to the snobs, the prudes. Everywhere. They're always, they've been brought up in this switch, dogmatic switch, point of view. Switch dogmatic is exactly yeah. the right word. Yeah. And anyone who's ideological or monolithic in their beliefs, it just doesn't work. Ideologues are idiots. 
Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm going to have a whiskey neat shirts made. Ideologues or idiots. <laughs> there we drink go. Drink it how you like it shirts. So our, Those will be up on the site. Our, soon. our, our first slogan is Black Sheep. I, I, I can't say enough great things about Amy, but uh, yeah, our first slogan was Drown Ideology in Beer. Yeah. And the whole idea was like, we're going to just crush what your expectations are and we're going to break it apart. We're going to build it right back together. And for the people who aren't looking closely enough, maybe it does look the same, right? But uh, there are a lot of dreams to go beers out in the market, but there are not a dream to go be- there are not dreams to go beers. Well, maybe there are, but this is very well built in in a way that where Ryan broke it. I broke it apart. We spent a lot of time discussing what really makes a dream to cool a dream to cool the creaminess factor, the mouthfeel. Do you even taste the creaminess when you're having a dream to cool? How much is this? How much is that? All that sort of stuff. We engaged a full creative idea by breaking it apart to rebuild it together and restructure it in a new way that no one else has done. So, you know, Miles Davis, when he released Kind of Blue, he brought modal music, you know, modal uh modal music to jazz is a very classical approach. He was training at Juilliard at the time. And of course the people, you know, the the people in the room with him were like, this is awesome. I've never heard anything like this. The critics are like, mm, I don't know about jazz. It's noise, right? Have you and, seen um, Bohemian Rhapsody? Not yet. Yeah. Okay. So the, in, when that song was released, it was universally hated by all critics. Yeah. It was, it was, a mess. It was a uh, like four different music styles rolled into one. I mean, it was just this garbage, yeah. mo- like uh, just a fusion that no one ever really appreciated until much later. And now it is a classic example and, and, of eighties operatic rock music. And roll mm-hmm. back four hundred years, and Shakespeare was not necessarily appreciated by the by the Queen's Court or the critics until later in his career, right? All, all the time. You look at poetry, you look at plays, you look at written, you know, written art, you look at, uh, Picasso, the way he broke lines and rebuilt them, the way, uh, uh, you know, just left, right, and center in all creative meaning, medium, right? Their definers are always I one step it. behind the, the true creatives. And, and it just is a factor. That's just what it is, you know? And, and it, comes back to the idea that if you're really being creative, destruction is an important part of creativity. They're going to break it. They're going to build it back. And then that also plays over to the business theory point as well, because you're asking about Amazon as a threat or Walmart as a threat. Well, if you take a creative approach to, to uh, strategy and a corporate uh, corporate development and and what space you want to play in, then you're deconstructing the idea. You're building it right back up. You're taking inventory of what you're good at. You're taking inventory of what you're bad at. And you're creating a, a defensible position that is different than anyone else's. And you're at the forefront of business strategy and you're navigating new waters. And we can't see those waters today, but you can see a badass team and the upper management over at Buffalo Bayou, and we're going to be fine. You know. So, so going back to this this beer to go because we kind of touched on it, but yeah. then we moved away from it. What what was just passed? Uh, s- nothing. I mean, it, well, it, let's break an, it down a little an bit. An amendment was yeah. tacked on to the sunset review. So, okay. if you think about the front door, the front door would have been this is what we want to have happen in the house, right? And the bill would have been an up or down vote, right? That did not happen. So TABC is up for review every 12 years. So just like you see in big boy politics in DC, like we just introduced basically a a poison pill rider of sorts where we're saying, okay, well, if you want TABC to literally exist, you have to pass this amendment with it. So they tacked on a rider with the sunset bill. Now the Senate's going to do that in parallel, and we don't know what that's going to look like. I mean, so it's passed the House. Beer to go is passed, and what happened on Sunday as well? That's that's a part of that, right? But but. For those who aren't aware, what what was you, they moved it from noon to ten? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a retail aspect of it. Yeah. So, um, and uh, I forget the representative, but he had a great quote where he's saying, "You can buy a mimosa at a country club at ten a.m., but you can't buy a beer until noon on Sundays." So, what wh- what they're doing with these two amendments, at least from my perspective, is we're, we're trying to take the beer codes and just make them internally consistent. 
you know? Because if, if you think about the logic of why can a country club sell a mimosa at 10 a.m., but H-E-B can't let me buy a, a six-pack of beer on the way to a tailgate or on the way to sure. a, you know, a, a, a football party, right? It's not internally consistent. The logic underpinning the 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 the, the hair fr- like the spirit hair of the law. splitting yeah. Yeah, yeah not just the spirit of the law but just like the hair thin changes that they make where they're like oh well liquor store is not on sunday but beer you know it's just like well, what is consistent what is a driving ideology or spirit of the law that manifests itself in an internally consistent way well this spirit is confused with this you know the three-headed monster kind of arguing amongst itself, right? And and then that's why the law is just so chaotic. <clears throat> so the next step is it going to the Senate? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you think it'll pass or no? You know, I uh, – Both beer to go and getting it two hours early on Sunday. I mean, I've got a pretty good sense of how the rest of today is going to go for me and my personal life, but I'm still not really sure, and I've got no sense of tomorrow. I certainly cannot a great saying as well. miss Cleo – these bureaucrats who have so many different competing interests and competing issues. If the Texas legislature is serious about deregulating, if they are serious about consistency, if they are serious about creating a clear set of guidelines that are equal and fair, if Texas wants to be the same as the other 49 states that are more forward thinking as it relates to this part of the craft beer industry, if Texas legislatures want to be consistent with vodka and whiskey and wine, then yes, it will pass. But if they get myopic, if they allow uh, special interests to get involved, if I'm, I'm not at all confident in their ability to do the right thing and make this happen because time and again, we've been Charlie Browned by trying to play by the rules and trying to do it the right way. Just to have the football lifted. Just a football <laughs> lifted at the last second. And it's like, come yeah. on, man. Like, oh, I thought we were talking about this and we all agreed on that. But, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, I, w- I will say I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not in the room for these calls because it, uh, you know, we've got a really great lobbyist for the Craft Brewers Guild. The, you know, our executive director Charles is phenomenal, and uh, the guys in the room are are doing a great job. You know, Awesome Beer Works. I, I have such immense respect for them, and and the guys over there, Michael and Adam, are just phenomenal guys, and they're really leading the charge on our behalf. So it's really hard for me not to sit on the sideline and not like jump in and try and micromanage. But they're doing such a great job. We're following their leadership. Um, um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do the little shameless plug. If consumers want to to hear the craft brewer side of the equation, craftpack.org. So that's C-R-A-F-T-P-A-C.org is org uh, is, is a great organization. Um, I've, I've personally donated personal money to them. Obviously, I've got a vested interest. I got a dog in the hunt, right? Sure. But, uh, but. But they, there's anything wrong with it. Yeah, but they're doing a really phenomenal job at consumer education. I will also criticize at the same time that I'm pumping them up, and I will say that I don't care for the character of the rhetoric that's coming out of my craft beer brethren because we, you know, if you're reading a, a thing on that website and they're saying wholesalers, just please understand that it's not all of them. It's not all. Whenever we paint a broad brush. I think that's that's part of the reason why the craft brewers guild is struggling. It's the same thing that moment. happens in regular politics. The left or the right. And, right? And and why do we just, even say that? I was at a birthday party literally last night with a dear friend and then her friend and, and I probably have ninety five percent policy overlap and agreement and it's eleven PM and we're a couple wine in and she just starts berating me at the top of her lungs and I'm like, time out. This conversation, we're not having this conversation right now. And it's just ridiculous the way politics is just so geared up right now. And you're looking across the table. But the thing about it that I don't understand is that these craft brewers are bad-mouthing their only customer. I've only got four distributors, so I've got four customers. You know? Sure. And they're bad mouthing these these customers. It's like I would never you would never get on Twitter and talk talk smack about your wife. You handle that behind closed doors in the right way. Do it all the time. 
Well, that's, well, actually, that's between you and her. actually, <laughs> I also saw the way you approach that muffin top and you can probably get away with a lot with that. Uh, looks like that baby. <laughs> the greater point I was trying to make. <laughs> um, oh. No, I'm, I'm with you. 100%. Are you blushing? I'm I can't tell blushing. with yeah, the color yeah, palette. Yeah, I'm always wrong. I'm always red. Um, no, I'm with you 100%. One last question and then we got to go. This will be nice and quick and short. Craft beer rooms, tap rooms, family oriented or don't bring your kids. We're a hard driving industrial facility. And if you're not looking at your three year old and they face plant into a metal drain, that's bad parenting. Okay. So that's not my question. I'm with we, you 100%. We being have, a good parent, it's just like we guns. Have, we have parents and we have kids all the time. My favorite thing about our brewery is that you come, you know, we're, we're open, what, 11 to 11 to uh, 11 on Saturdays now? Yeah, we got a, a full 12 hours on Saturday. And um, I mean, even on Sundays, it's uh, 11 to 6. So, you know, there's plenty of time for if you want to pop in, have a beer. But at the same time, to your point, a lot of people get really up in arms about even at restaurants. Oh, there's a kid here. There's a kid here. Know what you're getting into. You know, uh, the, there's different breweries that serve different uh, demographics. There's different, uh, I guess, a, a different geo fence around certain sure. breweries that they they naturally have a propensity for families versus, uh, you know, a, a different segment. And know what you're getting into. It, yeah. and, and I, I mean, beer brings people together. The whole point of what we do is community. And, and that's why we're not uh, doing this thing or this thing or this thing. And so my favorite thing about our Saturdays and our Sundays is that you come and it's like my married friends who have like five-year-olds and six-year-olds, they can let them run around and they can have fun and we can be adults together. You can't do that in a bar, you know. But if people are looking for a bar experience, go to a bar. We're not a bar. <clears throat> uh, so with a tap room. I will tell you that uh, my turn to give my opinion on this, uh, and we'll end on this. I think that I was in Ireland in 2015, 2014. Me and my wife went to Ireland for a week and then over to Scotland and visited distilleries, the churches. And on a Sunday, we walked into the oldest pub in all of Europe from 900 AD called Sean's Bar in Athlone. Wow. And we sat down, we ordered a Guinness some fish and chips, and we just wanted to experience the place, right? This place is 1,100 years old. It's one of the oldest bars in all the world. And we're sitting there. It's Sunday around noon. A grandfather, his daughter, uh, a, a grown woman, her husband, and their three kids came in, and they sat down and had fish and chips in a pub, a bar. We don't call them pubs. They're bars, right? And I remember thinking – our drinking culture is uh, here in the U.S. is so different. We would we would pass judgment on that completely. Puritanical. We went to Luby's, right? I would yeah. order the Luan on Sunday after church. I wouldn't come to a, bu a pub for a pint. Yeah, and and I fully support uh, tap rooms and breweries as a family oriented environment. There is nothing wrong. You go up to Southern Star and Conroe. They do have like the park benches and the games and the hacky sack and the what's the cornhole. Yeah, it, it's not. A place necessarily for kids. You have to keep an eye on them, but that's anywhere you go. Yeah. Responsible parenting is not a factor of the discussion. It should be a given. Our drinking culture, I think, has to change to be less judgmental and more accepting of uh, – we should normalize all things. I agree. We we have a come-as-you-are approach to hops, hospitality, and we train our staff on that. You said and hops first. Did you hear yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. Hospitality. That's great, actually. Maybe that needs to go on a shirt. It's maybe. coming to whiskeyneat.com. <laughs> I'm trying to be Speaking hospitable which, right now. We do now. have some presents for you real quick. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah so, That's right. Uh, Since uh, Friday, have, yeah, May Saturday. May 4th on Saturday. May the 4th be with you oh, there. That's Brew nice. That is. Not. I've already. There's no try. I've already sent a cease and desist. Yes, yes. Yeah. As well Thanks, as, man. Uh, so cease and desist number two is going to be just brew it here. <laughs> That's so, hilarious. Right there. We uh, we will find a way to create legal problems no matter what. <laughs> no we matter what the issue. have to say anything. Thanks, man. What size are these? Uh, triple XL. I mean, That's the, awkward. the <laughs> photos on Facebook XL, XL like, kind of, you know, XL look works. a little different than in person. XL works. And yeah, XL. So they kind of called it. I don't know if I'm offended or hurt, but. Um, <laughs> That's right. Well, he gave me XL too. Lot, obviously. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. My aggressive pores are full of protein. Um, thanks so much for coming on uh, the show. Brother, thank you so much for having thanks us. Thanks so much, guys. Awesome. I feel like we covered enough topics to piss off at least somebody. So. There we go. So that's, that's the way to do what it. we do best. Sweet. Yes. Cheers. Cheers. I'll take that. Oh, there's nothing in your glass. That's bad luck. Got don't do that. Oh, I got Put right something there. in your glass. Okay. 
if I have to. <laughs>